Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rouse IS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. An answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of UPSC examination. Today we are going to cover Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 15th of May 2020. The articles which we are going to cover today are displayed on the screen. Let's now begin the discussion. We are very proud to announce Rao's IAS hybrid online program to prepare for civil services examination 2021. The program is designed in such a manner that it will ensure same quality content at your home as we deliver here at our campuses. It also gives you the flexibility to join our campuses as and when you are ready to join the physical class program at our learning centers. Our GSI hybrid course has been designed to provide 360 degree guidance. First, our teaching covers everything from basics to advanced and given the dynamic nature of the exam, we focus on both static as well as current affairs. Second, we focus a lot on discussions and doubt solving to be able to impart real understanding of issues important for the exam and so we promote group discussions and make expert doubt solving available to you at all times. Third, testing is another key requirement to crack the exam. The course gives you ample practice through class tests and UPSC level test series. And finally, just before the PLIMS and mains exams, we help you revise everything important through our highly targeted revision modules. If you want more information, you can log on to our website and download the GSI hybrid brochure. The description of the video has the link for that as well. You can also get in touch with us using your preferred way. All the necessary details are given in the brochure, so please refer to that. From the entire team of Rao's IS, we wish you all the very best and we will be happier to partner with you in your journey of success. So I guess by now you might have realized that today's discussion is going to be about the second tranche of announcements by our finance minister, which is focused heavily on our vulnerable sections, especially dealing with urban poor, migrants and farmers. Now, as you might be aware that in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, the situation across all the sectors of economy is extremely grim. And that is why the Prime Minister has announced a special economic package of Rs 20 lakh crore few days back. And in the same announcement, he made it clear that there are going to be a set of announcements by Finance Minister every other day, which will deal with the sectors of economy one by one. And so the first tranche was announced two days ago, which was discussed in detail yesterday by Nagendra sir. So in the DNS dated 14th of May 2020, the economic packages related to MSMEs were discussed in detail. For example, provision of collateral free automatic loans, subordinate debt for stressed MSMEs, equity infusion through MSME fund of funds, changes to MSME definitions, preference to MSME for government tenders and financial support to the NBFCs. Now, if you haven't watched that DNS, it is extremely important that you go through that DNS done by Nagendra sir on 14th of May 2020. Because not only did he discuss the announcements, but he also dealt into each and every concept. For example, subordinate debt, what is it and how does it matter? The issue related to fund of funds, how the changes in definitions of MSME is going to impact the manufacturing sector and issues related to NBFCs. So once again, to clearly understand the highlighting points of the first tranche of announcements by Finance Minister, go through the DNS of 14th of May. Now yesterday, the Finance Minister came up with the second set of announcements. And today in newspaper, you will find it scattered around the newspaper. For example, this news on page number one, migrant workers to get free food grains. On page number six, you have two editorials, one for the poor and the second one is lockdown syndrome. Then on page number eight, we have stimulus for small businesses, vendors and farmers. And finally, on page number 15, we have affordable housing to cement a place in reality sector. So what we have done is that we have combined all these news items into one complete discussion because after all these were the announcements made by the finance minister targeting a single set of Indian people and those are vulnerable sections dealing with urban poor, 
migrants and farmers so we'll discuss them all together now the editorial on page number 6 gives out the data of index of industrial production for the month of march for which the official data is slowly becoming available and the impact of lockdown is clearly being reflected on data given by the iip for example the overall industrial activity has contracted significantly now here you will have to make a distinction between contraction in industrial production and decline in growth rate so decline in growth rate is a normal phenomena which happens throughout the year due to various reasons and if you see the chart of india's iip and if you plot the growth rate versus months it will look something like this but this is different from contraction now contraction means that this growth rate has gone into negative territory which means that it is marked by negative growth rate so this is not a reduction in production but this is overall decline in the production which has happened which is quite a rare phenomena for a developing country like india and thanks to covid this has happened so overall india's iip contracted by around 16.7% and you know that there are various components of iip and the manufacturing sector has witnessed a contraction of around 20% similarly all other sectors have observed a great deal of contraction leading to overall industrial activity being contracted in the month of march it is expected that the data for april month is going to show even further devastation because if you remember that lockdown was imposed in the later days of the march especially after 20th of march so the month of march went with just 10 to 12 days of lockdown whereas in april the whole country was in strict lockdown for the whole month and it is expected that the iip will further go down due to this strict imposition of lockdown now as we have just said that the second set of measures are basically to target the vulnerable sections and to reduce the hardships faced by them specifically the migrant laborers street vendors migrant urban poor small traders self employed people and small farmers so what we have done is that we have categorized the steps taken by the government of india yesterday into three major problems which are specifically faced by these set of people now first and foremost we know that due to lockdown most of them have lost their sources of income and since majority of these poors living in metros are migrant workers and laborers they do not have their ration cards at the place of their work because they come from states like up bihar jharkhand odisha and hence more often than not they become ineligible to avail the benefits of the food subsidy at the destination so loss of income and lack of access to ration cards or food in combination leads to extreme hunger especially in a scenario like lockdown and for that government has come up with two specific interventions now first is that government has announced free food grain supplies to migrants and it has fast tracked its ambitious scheme one nation one ration card so migrants in various states require food grain assistance So the government yesterday declared that migrants who are neither National Food Security Act or state card beneficiaries in that particular city or state in which they are inhabiting right now will be provided with 5 kg of grains per person and 1 kg chana per family for next 2 months. What this means is that all those migrant laborers who don't have ration cards of that particular state or who are not beneficiaries of nfsa which are the two ways indians get the food subsidy right now and if a person is not entitled in any of those so the grains will be allocated on the basis of 5 kg per person whereas per family 1 kg of chana will also be allocated as a source of protein now what is important over here is that around 3500 crore expenditure will be incurred for providing this extended food subsidy for 2 months and all of that shall be borne by the central government whereas the state governments are responsible for implementation identification of migrants and full distribution and providing detailed guidelines as to how this shall be carried out but you know that this lockdown is going to end sometime and these migrant workers are going to go back to their place where they used to work and again they are going to be haunted by the same problem because their ration card still is not going to be applicable and hence they will not be able to avail the food subsidy 
and for that the government of india has decided to fast track a technology oriented intervention which is an ambitious scheme of government of india one nation one ration card now this is an important intervention and it is also a part of pm's technology driven system reforms which is a matter of another discussion one nation one ration card is a part of reforms being carried out by government of india as far as public distribution system is concerned for which the government of india in 2018 launched integrated management of public distribution system or impds the main objective of this scheme was to introduce nationwide portability of ration card holders under nfsa 2013 through one nation one ration card system this system enables the migratory ration card holders to lift their entitled food grains from any fair price shop of their choice in the country by using their existing or the earlier same ration card issued in their home state and to avail this portability just like your mobile number portability what these beneficiaries have to do is that they just have to go through a biometric authentication on electronic point of sale devices which is awesome because these migrant laborers don't stick to a particular place because the jobs in which they work keeps on migrating and this automatic biometric authentication will let them transfer their food subsidy from one state to another just after a simple biometric authentication so you can say that they will be kind of assured of the food supplies wherever they go or travel across the country now yesterday government announced that 100% national portability will be achieved by march 2021 so you can see that as far as the food and hunger issues of these vulnerable sections is concerned the government has taken a short term action of course to immediately ensure that food be served to them but it has not ignored the long term needs of these people because just after the lockdown ends they are going to come back to the same big cities let us now move to next important issue faced by the migrant laborers and urban poors and is that of housing you know that how expensive urban areas can get combined with that low income of the migrant workers leaves them no option but to live in slums also the prices of real estate in the urban areas are so expensive that ultimately they are not left with any other option except for densely populated slums like dharavi to live in not only does unhygienic living makes them even more vulnerable as far as their health condition is concerned but also takes a great toll on their mental well being and hence the government has come up with two solutions which are going to go in long way in ensuring affordable housing for all these sections of people so we know that migrant labor and urban poor face challenges in getting houses at affordable rents and hence government will launch a scheme under pradhan mantri awas yojana for these section of people to provide ease of living at affordable rent and the government will utilize three mechanisms for that so either the central government will directly fund the construction of housing societies and then it will transform them into affordable rental housing complexes under the ppp mode which means that the government will first construct a big housing complex just like in china and then it will be handed over to a private party which shall then enter into a revenue sharing arrangement with the government for the maintenance of that complex and migrant labor along with the families will be able to live in those societies which will provide for all the basic amenities ensuring a minimum level of sanitation hygiene clean air and water and the second way the government is trying to come up is that it will incentivize the private developers as well as the state governments in form of various kinds of loans to develop affordable rental housing complexes although the fine print of this scheme is still to be made available but nonetheless government has promised that it will come out with this scheme very soon apart from that a provision of pradhan mantri awas yojana will also be utilized in a great way to incentivize the middle income group to purchase or construct their own houses you know that pradhan mantri awas yojana urban has four various components which has been discussed in dns a lot of times but one of them is credit link subsidy scheme for middle income group we shall not go into the details of pradhan mantri awas yojana urban or rural 
will just go into credit link subsidy scheme now you know that for most of the people buying home means taking loan from nbfcs or banks now depending upon the prevailing market situation the bank charges interest rate on the loan taken by the person to purchase the property and that varies from time to time and place to place but in general it is 11 to 12% now what government of india thought of under the credit linked subsidy scheme is that home buyers in this category will be eligible for an interest rate subsidy of around 6.5% for a period of 20 years or for the entire tenor of the home loan whichever is lower so if you belong to this category and subsequently approach a bank or nbfc for a home loan this incentive is initially credited to your account by the lender or the bank from whom you avail the loan the lender then lowers the emis for you as per the credited value so what this scheme does is that it takes away huge financial burden away from a middle class family or lower middle class family in urban areas by reducing the emis that they have to pay to the banks to around half of that now what the government has decided is to extend this credit link subsidy scheme up to march 2021 by the end of current financial year now this is expected to benefit around 2.5 lakh middle income families during the current year and it will lead to an investment of around 70000 crore in housing sector now this is expected to create significant number of jobs by giving boost to housing sector and will stimulate the demand for steel cement transport and other construction materials so both these schemes are going to create huge demands for housing sector and the, and you know that main components of the housing sector are construction material and the construction material mainly comprises of steel and cement and various other stuff so all this will lead to increase in manufacturing sector as well as a boost to mining sector and for construction of large housing society huge machineries will be needed which will then spur the demand for capital goods as well as heavy equipments and all of that cannot be done without human labor and hence it will give rise to a lot of construction labor demand which are basically unskilled in nature providing employment to lakhs of people so after having discussed the issues related to hunger and the solutions prepared by the government in the second set as well as that related to housing we now move on to the last set which has been addressed yesterday and that is employment creation and especially self employment creation through access to capital now we know that due to lockdown the street vendors have been one of the most impacted sections of society if not the most and hence government has decided to come up with a special scheme just for street vendors a special scheme will be launched within a month to facilitate easy access to credit for street vendors under this scheme bank credit facility for initial working capital of up to 10000 rupees for each enterprises will be extended now according to the government this scheme will cover urban as well as rural vendors doing business in adjoining urban areas use of digital payments and timely repayments will be incentivized through monetary rewards so the punctuality in repayment of loans shall be rewarded in terms of lower interest rates it is expected that about 50 lakh street vendors will be benefited under this scheme and the amount of around 5000 crore is expected to be lent through this mechanism now the government came out with mudra scheme few years back and devised three separate kinds of loans for different set of people now comment below to let us know that you know about the three kinds of loans as well as the limits of loan disbursement among each of them anyways so small businesses under mudra have been disrupted the most and has also impacted their capacity to pay emis now we know that loan moratorium has already been granted by rbi now the government of india has decided to provide interest subvention of 2% for prompt pays for a period of 12 months to mudra shishu loanees who have loans below rupees 50000 so what it basically means is that if you somehow manage to pay your loans on time the government is going to reward you with reduction in the interest which you have to pay now government hopes that this particular intervention will cost the central government around 1500 crore rupees now you know that most of these migrant workers are returning back to their villages and their villages do not have employment opportunities 
and most of these laborers are unskilled so the government has come up with a solution and these solutions already existed but the government has decided to increase the allocation or the budgetary allocations for these schemes which are campa good old manrega so approximately 6000 crore rupees of funds shall be released under campa for afforestation and plantation works including in urban areas now this is expected to create job opportunities in urban semi urban and rural areas and this is going to specifically help our tribals because majority of work related to forest management and conservation and afforestation is going to be conducted in tribal areas now the central government has clearly instructed the state governments to utilize the funds released by the center in afforestation and plantation works which can be in urban areas artificial regeneration assisted natural regeneration forest management soil and moisture conservation works forest protection forest and wildlife related infrastructural development wildlife protection management etc now you should keep an important aspect in mind is that it will solve two problems on one hand it will provide employment to the needy but at the same time it will help achieve india's indcs now india has promised a big deal as far as nationally determined contributions are concerned to enhance the carbon sinks which are basically forest do you know how much india has promised to increase the carbon sink by 2030 Similarly government has increased the allocation for the manrega and has clearly instructed the state governments to not stop the work under manrega in monsoon season because most of the work done under manrega is such that it cannot be continued in monsoon season but the government has now decided to take up various activities related to plantation horticulture livestock related shed development and such other things which can be continued even during the monsoon which is about to begin in few days then states have been clearly instructed to provide work to the migrants who are returning back to their homes the government also released the data yesterday that around 50 to 40% more person have enrolled this year as compared to same month last year which clearly shows that manrega is absorbing the extra unemployed workforce created due to lockdown now self help groups is another key component of india's action against covid pandemic now we shall not go into the details of how self help group works and what role does revolving fund play as far as functioning of self help groups are concerned because it will stretch the discussion but the disposal of revolving fund to self help groups was onboarded on paisa portal in april 2020 now the government is planning to integrate this disbursal of revolving fund to self help groups on paisa portal by the end of this month which will greatly help the self help groups which are a great way of not only mobilization of bpl families but is a great way to empower women finally moving on to the last section which the government has decided to target yesterday as far as the benefits are concerned and that is farmers Now the government has not come up with any specific intervention for this section but it has enhanced the allocation under already existing mechanisms which are the refinancing mechanism of nabard and allocation under pm kisan using kisan credit cards now the nabard has been instructed to extend additional refinance support of around 30000 crore for meeting crop loan requirements of regional rural banks and regional cooperative banks now i hope that you understand what refinance means now refinance means financing what has already been financed so what government does is that assures the banks to finance the farmers as far as their crop loan requirements are concerned now obviously we know that agriculture is extremely tricky business and especially during the times we live where the climate change is impacting the weather patterns the crop loans have become extremely extremely risky and hence banks are worried about how to loan the farmers now what government does is that asks banks and especially the regional rural banks to extend loans to farmers and then nabard intervenes and finances these banks with an equal amount so you can say that the loan which is extended by the banks to the farmers is ultimately taken over by the nabard and hence through this refinancing mechanism reducing the risks for these financial institutions Similarly the government has announced a special drive to provide concessional credit to PM Kisan beneficiaries through Kisan credit cards 
fishermen and animal husbandry farmers will also be included in this category now this will inject additional liquidity of around 2 lakh crore in farming sector helping around 2.5 crore farmers so these were the announcements done by the finance minister yesterday all the notes are available in the pdf along with the screenshot so just to give you a quick recap of how a special economic package of 20 lakh crore is unfolding so the first set of announcements was done by finance minister which was discussed in yesterday's dns which you should watch which has described each and every step in great detail and it mainly dealt with msme sector Similarly, yesterday, Finance Minister came up with the second set of announcements, which mainly dealt with vulnerable sections and how to uplift their conditions. We have categorized these intervention in form of hunger, food, housing and access to capital and providing them with employment opportunities. So this is it as far as special economic package of rupees 20 lakh crore is concerned. Now, two editorials appear in today's newspaper. One of them is stop the return to laissez fair on page number six. And the next one is are India's labor laws too restrictive on page number seven. And both these articles provide a very, very strong rebuttal to the discussions we had on 12th of May 2020, just three days ago. Because you know that UP and MP government along with various other governments are bringing far reaching changes into their labor laws arguing that they will enable these states to attract investments in industrial sector. So the discussion on 12th of May dealt with why these changes are being brought, mainly to utilize the opportunity of surplus labor, as well as there's a probability that the manufacturing is going to shift from China and we can attract that investment by enacting these changes. Now, as far as the question of how a state can bring about changes in concurrent list is concerned, it was also dealt in that discussion. Also in the same discussion, we noted three major challenges which the current framework of labor laws poses as far as industrial development is concerned and how it impacts the overall economic scenario of our country, mainly introducing dwarfism in our industrial sector leading to informalization of our workforce and it also threatens the development of human capital formation and overall all of them together lead to reduction of global competitiveness of Indian manufacturing sector and hence we arrived at the conclusion that it is important for us to reform these labor laws. Just on the contrary today these two editorials provide us an alternate view as to how to look to these issues. Just on the contrary, these two editorials criticize the steps taken by the state government and both these editorials in combination provide us constitutional, statutory and economical reasons as to why the changes made by UP and MP are untenable, unconstitutional and unfeasible. Now you see that is the beauty behind reading the newspaper every day. So first there is a news which is published just as a matter of fact then there will be an opinion either supporting or opposing it and then the counter through that will also be published. So if you keep on reading the newspaper, you will get both merits, demerits, positive, negatives and these are essential fodder material as far as mains examination is concerned. Also in the interview, you will be better placed to put forward both the sides of the coins if you are continuously in touch with the newspaper. So the authors of the first editorial say that these laws which have been made inapplicable in the state of UP for the next three years serve a very important purpose as far as labor is concerned. For example, the Factories Act limits the work shift to eight hours, provides for overtime wages, weekly offs as well as leaves with wages. So the employer cannot force leave without pay for a limited number of leaves. Only if the number of leaves extend beyond that limit will the wages be cut. Similarly, Industrial Dispute Act ensures workers' participation to resolve disputes through negotiations and it serves a very important purpose of avoiding lockouts and strikes. Similarly, we know that Minimum Wages Act ensures minimum income which ensures the life and liberty of a person. And then Trade Unions Act provides legal and corporate status to trade unions. 
it also defines their rights and their liability so that they can act in more organized and coordinated manner. Now the authors say that these labor laws do not exist without a reason and they have a context and especially in India's case they have a special place in our history because of our experience with that of British industrialization. We shall not go into those details because we obviously know through our reading of modern history that how pathetic the situation was for our Indian workers and especially those employed in British firms functioning in the country. Now the two articles together argue that there are major issues which might lead to reversal of these changes brought about by UP government. And even if the reversals are not made, the economic rational behind these changes will ensure the purposes for which these changes are being made remain unserved. So we'll start with the constitutional issues with the changes. Now there are two such issues. Now the first one, as we discussed in the DNS of 12th May, that labor belongs to concurrent list, which means that both state and center can enact laws. Now all these laws which have been inactivated by the UP government have been enacted by the parliament. And although the constitution provides for overriding powers to state legislation if they get approved from the president, but there is no such precedent that a statutory void be created due to an act of state government. What this means is that UP government has inactivated factories laws, minimum wages act, trade unions act and industrial dispute act, but it has not provided for anything else on that place. So what it means that in UP, all these things will hang in middle of nowhere and they will act without any statutory backing. So these eminent lawyers which have published this editorial argue you cannot override a central legislation to create a vacuum or a void. Similarly, a very important Supreme Court judgment to quote over here is LIC versus DJ Bahadur and others in 1980, in which Supreme Court stated that whenever an act of state negatively impacts the terms and conditions or services of a person or a set of persons, a legislation is a must. So without enacting a law, you cannot negatively impact a person's service conditions. So these are the two things which have a constitutional basis. But these two articles also argue that there is a statutory as well as economic problem as well. Now as far as statutory problem is concerned, they quote very specific provisions which we shall not go into because they are not important from the perspective of civil services examination. But on 12th of May, we discuss that these laws itself provide for their inactivation. For example, they contain a clause of public emergency whereby the state government during a public emergency can leave these laws inapplicable. Now the author today give the exact wording of these public emergency, which says that grave emergency whereby the security of India or any part of the territory is threatened by war or external aggression or internal disturbance. So if this is a situation, a state government can notify that these industrial laws will remain inactive. But the author says that since public emergency has been so specifically determined that it is not applicable in the times of pandemic. So even if the argument of MP government that the central legislation itself provides for this clause has no basis in the law itself. Now moving on to the economic rationale. Now the first and foremost is that whenever we say that if we will disable all these labor laws then the investments will grow rapidly in the country or the particular state which will lead to increase in demand of labor and this market mechanism will ensure that all the people are getting paid respectable amounts. But one must remember in all of these discussions that India still remains a labor surplus country particularly at the lower ends of the labor spectrum where less education is required there is usually an excess supply of labor which gives more bargaining power to employers so in these kinds of specific scenarios it's the responsibility of the state to safeguard the interests of the labor through legislation because the market does not give them necessary protection then further the argument that the economic activity will certainly and magically thrive just because of waiver of these labor laws does not hold any economic basis because the economic activity in an area or a region is just not determined by the labor laws. It is also determined by overall health of the economy, level of demand in that particular country or area, 
परचेजिंग पावर ऑफ द पीपल हु अल्टीमेटली डिसाइड वॉट टू मैन्युफैक्चर बिकॉज इन अ कैपिटलिस्ट इकोनॉमी ओनली दोज कम्युनिटीज गेट मैन्युफैक्चर विच कैन बी सोल्ड सो दिस परचेजिंग पावर इज एक्सट्रीमली इंपॉर्टेंट देन स्टेबिलिटी ऑफ द बिजनेस क्लाइमेट एंड वॉट इज द एक्सटर्नल सिचुएशन और द एक्सटर और द एक्सपोर्ट कंडीशन सो यू कैन सी दैट लेबर इज जस्ट वन एडिशन टू दीज कंडीशन सो इफ अदर कंडीशन रिमेन द सेम जस्ट ट्वीकिंग द लेबर लॉज इज नॉट गोइंग टू हेल्प रैम्प अप द प्रोडक्शन इन द इकोनॉमी सो दीज टू एडिटोरियल्स टूगेदर प्रोवाइड अ वेरी वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग arguments against the steps which have been taken by various state governments in the country keep these arguments in the mind let's now move on to the summary for prelims examination now for the purpose of revision from the perspective of prelims examination we thought it would be a better idea to revise various provisions dealing with the welfare of the labor in our constitution itself and i'm sure there is going to be few surprises for you as well starting with article 19 1c all citizens shall have the right to form associations or unions or cooperative societies so basically this is the article which gives these labor unions the right to organize themselves into unions then article 21 talks about protection of life and personal liberty which says that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to the procedures established by law and you know that from time to time various judgments of supreme court of india have expanded the meaning of protection of life and personal liberty and in line with these various judgments of supreme court have also included various rights of labors under article 21 then we have prohibition of forced labor in article 23 then article 24 talks about prohibition of employment of children in factories so these are the major portions of the fundamental rights which deal with the rights of the labors of course other rights are applicable to them as well let us now move on to directive principles of state policy and in that article 39a talks about the state shall in particular direct its policies towards securing that the citizens men and women equally have the right to adequate means of livelihood although adequate means of livelihood is not same as minimum wage but nonetheless it talks about providing adequate means of livelihood to the citizens then article 41 talks about right to work and to public assistance in cases of unemployment then article 42 is very specific which talks about provisions for just and humane conditions of work and maternity relief then article 43 talks about living wage for workers and article 43a talks about participation of workers in management of industries so you see that such a wide spectrum of rights and principles have been dealt in our constitution as far as the labors are concerned so here is a summary of whatever we have discussed in the summary for prelims and you can take the screenshot of this slide and keep it with yourself because of questions in prelims examination can be asked because because right now labor laws have become rife Now I hope that for solving all other questions you are going to e-learn and attempting them in interactive manner because all the questions which earlier used to be solved in DNS are now available in form of quiz in our e-learn just by creating a free and basic account. Now as far as the question of the day for 14th of May 2020 is concerned the question was cold start doctrine is related to which of the following? and the right answer is that it is a policy followed by india to defend her borders and it's a special military doctrine that has been developed by indian armed forces for use in possible war with pakistan and it has a great strategic implications as well now the question of the day for today is consider the following statements about pmay statement 1 the scheme is implemented by home ministry and will ensure housing for all by 2022 statement 2 says under the scheme middle income groups with annual incomes from 6 lakhs to 18 lakhs per year are eligible for interest subsidy on housing loans which of the statements given above ways are correct statement a one only b two only c both one and two d neither one nor two